Hello everyone, I'm Atena Negrescu and I am here at the Hippocrates Wellness with the psychotherapist um, Andy uh, Roman. Roman, yes, from Romania. From Romania. <laughs> no. No. Uh, Andy, tell me for how much time you work here in the institute. Are you ready for this? Yes. <laughs> I've been here for 31 years. Wow. wow. I was here before most of the buildings were here. <laughs> I remember <laughs> that you tell me this. And how you can be so positive with so many um, story, sad story that you hear? Oh, oh. Well, uh, because the overall picture is that people get well here. And so they come here and, and it is, you know, to get ill is a sad thing. To be sick and to suffer, that's not happy. But then to see people get well, people with canes and crutches, I mean, it's, it's like a miracle and it happens very quickly. Part of it is the food and the other part is the whole atmosphere here is very healing. It's so supportive and there's a lot of love here. And people finally learn how to live a healthy lifestyle and the body responds quickly sometimes so that's very optimistic yeah that's it's it's fun it's beautiful you know people come here and they've heard from the medical world you know get your affairs in order there's nothing we can do for you and the optimism of brian and anna maria in itself is medicine and we're all optimistic here not because we're nice people only but because we've seen it work so that's a real natural optimism. Yes, yes. Do you think we can heal the body without healing the soul or the mind? No. Why? I don't think so. Although, you know what, to be honest with you, I've seen people who they came here, they said, this is salad. I'm not a rabbit. I don't like it here. I hate this food. People have said that and they still got well. So, but I tell you what, their wellness process really kicked off when they said, you know what, this is working. And then they got more positive and optimistic and they like the taste of it because it's helping them. But in the beginning, it wasn't necessary. They didn't have to be on the team. It helps every time you, you get on the team of the healing forces. But in the beginning, you know, it just, it wins people over because it works. It's very simple. It's nature. This is nature at work. Yes. What do you think about the trauma that we have in the childhood? How they affect our life? I mean, that's a very big question. And that is really the focus, a big focus of my work. And it's such an honor to be here at, at a place that honors the inner life part of getting well. And it is true that when we're children, if you've ever spent any time with children, you know the children are so wide open. You know, when we're born, we don't speak a language. You know, your native language is Romanian. My native language was English. Um, how did we learn that language? We didn't, I didn't go to school to learn English. You know, you didn't go to school, you just learned it because you picked it up from home. And so we're, we're so suggestible and wide open when we're children. And a lot of times it depends on the family and it's different in different cultures, but we, we end up swallowing certain beliefs about ourselves and about the world. The life is hard and things, you know, those, no baby is born with that. It's things that we learn. And so does that affect our health? Yes, definitely. It affects everything. It affects our relationship life. It affects our work life. It affects us to the point of um, limiting our beliefs as to what we deserve or don't deserve. And there have been people who have come here who have actually said out loud, I don't deserve to get well. And so with a belief like that, you think they're gonna get well if they eat they can eat green food till they turn green. 
and that's not going to work. So our beliefs really affect our physical well-being. And a big part of the program that I'm part of is to help people open up again, to be like a child and, and accept good things. You know, accept your health, accept that that belongs to you. It's so, so important. I can be happy without um, healing myself of the trauma. I can have a fulfilled life. Oh, you're asking that, if yes. that's possible? Yes. Yes, to some degree. You know, if there is a big stone in the middle of rushing water, the water will go around it, but it won't be a happy stream, if you know what I mean. It has to work around the stone. And trauma is like that big stone that, yes, the flow of life will find a way somehow to move forward. But it's just better when you can remove the stone and then it flows so forcefully and strongly because that's health. Health feels good. We're, we're made to feel good. We're made to be healthy. That's good news, big time good news. <laughs> I tell you, it's not uncommon to hear people say, I haven't felt this good for 10 years. I have never felt this good. We hear that all the time. Do you know how rewarding it is to work at a place like that? I used to work in the hospital. I never heard that. <laughs> I feel better now than I ever did. No. Do you think that we punish ourselves for the trauma that we had in, in the childhood? Yes, that's not uncommon because children, I'm going to say it this way, it sounds not nice, but children in their ignorance take responsibility for everything, right? There'll be a child playing on the floor with some toys and somebody, adult person comes in the room and they're angry and the child will start crying, I must have done something. When it had nothing to do with them. And the same is true. And, and of course, because we then come to believe that we're the source of whatever the bad thing is, we will punish ourselves. And that's one of the first things that has to go. And I will say that out loud to the guests that I work with. The time for self-punishment is over. And how can I do to not punish myself anymore? What can I do? Well, I mean, how would you help a child see that it's not her fault? You would reassure her, you would comfort her, you would love her, and then she'll start thinking, you know what, if this person loves me, maybe I'm okay. Maybe I didn't do it. Maybe it's not my fault. And then the kid part will start feeling good. That's when we adult people feel good, when the kid part of us gets liberated. We give that kid part permission to feel good. If, if you're blaming yourself for something bad, you're not going to let yourself feel good. That's punishment in itself. You know, you don't have to cut yourself or do anything. You just don't, don't let yourself feel good. That's punishment. Our nature, our nature is to feel good naturally. When we don't feel good naturally, we will try to feel good unnaturally. In how? <laughs> in what, how let me mean? let us count the ways. Children are into sugar and candy. I was so into candy when I was a boy. I mean, Halloween, that holiday where we you go and collect candy from people. That was my favorite holiday. I felt like a rich person. I had a bag full of gold, a bag full of candy. Um, remember. You remember. And so when we don't feel good naturally, we will pick all kinds of unhealthy ways sometimes to make ourselves feel good. And those just, those are never enough, never. But we'll keep trying. If we don't know how to get back to the original happiness, we'll keep doing unnatural things. What about addiction? Addiction is an extreme form of that because addiction can involve self-punishment, but it also, we don't pick things that 
hurt us in the immediate moment to be addicted to. We pick things that make us feel good. I've never done heroin, but I, I imagine it feels good. You know, I haven't, I haven't done a lot of, I've done a few things, but I'm, you know, those addictions are designed to keep us from feeling pain. And if they give us pleasure, you have a good, strong, addictive substance. Food is in that category because food gives us immediate pleasure. And so it's easy to, what's the typical thing that you see in the movies? When somebody breaks up with the girlfriend, the girlfriend will go and have ice cream, right? And they'll invite their friends and we'll have a feel sorry for myself, crying party, eating ice cream. That, that is an example of using an unhealthy way to feel good as a way to not feel bad. It just doesn't work. And then you end up getting diabetes. You know, you're lucky your boyfriend just broke up with you. It's, <laughs> this way you will end up with some serious medical condition. And we're not trained how to deal with emotional things. We're not trained in school. I don't, I don't know how schools no, are in Romania. No. But, you know, we learn reading and writing and arithmetic and history and geography. We didn't learn any skills on how to be a human. And so most people fumble around. We just fumble around in the world doing our best. And sometimes our best isn't any better than what we did when we were children. And when I was a kid, when I was sad, I went for candy. And I've replaced candy with other things. But the pattern is the same. Instead of learning how to actually grieve my losses, to celebrate my joy, to say I love you to people that I love, you know, to be in touch with my feelings. That's a big part of the healing process, is to become whole again. We are not whole. I, I don't think most people are whole. Most people Why? have holes. Why? <laughs> <laughs> and some people are assholes. No, I can't say that in the interview, can I? It's too late. I said it. <laughs> Why? Why we have holes? Oh, we are not whole. We, we aren't whole and we have holes because it was dangerous. There are certain parts of us that got us into trouble. And... A big part that gets us into trouble is feeling. If you work with, if you've ever been with little children, you'll see they're naturally loud and happy. When they're sad, they will cry. When they're angry, they will hit and scream. And, um, and they, that's what gets them into trouble. So we learn to shut down. We learn to put those things away. Our joy and our sorrow. We learn to live in the middle zone of don't feel too much, don't be too loud, don't make waves, just follow orders. That's a big problem. And it, I think that's in every culture because every culture wants people to be obedient so that we can have some order. Because if you've been in a relationship or have relationships, you know relationships can be messy. And if we don't have skills, we're just going to add to the mess. And then when things get too messy, everybody is uncomfortable. And then we need strong rules. That's why, this is my opinion, that's why so many countries are now opting for dictators. And we want, we want somebody to just tell us what to do and to punish the people that aren't doing it right. That's because we ourselves individually are lost. But there is hope. I mean, that sounds like a bleak thing I'm saying. But I'm very, very hopeful. A big part of healing means to become whole again. And that means to connect with our own hearts. That's the real, love is the healer. I mean, that sounds hippie-ish, but it's just, it's just true. It's just true. People don't do healthy things for themselves unless there is self-love. They just won't do it. People, you can learn the, you can learn about the Hippocrates program, yes. but you won't do it at home if you don't think you deserve to feel good, if you don't love yourself enough. I've heard the owners, Brian and Anna Maria, their message has changed over the years. 
from talking about sesame seeds and enzymes to inner qualities of self-love, empowerment, purpose, passion. Yes. That completely affirms the work that I do and my contribution here. And it confirms what I'm learning for myself. The inner life makes all the difference. My favorite lecture here is the Healing Circle. Um, tell me why it's so important to, to be in a circle with, um, with the people and to tell my story, to show me how I am. There's a man named Sidney Gerard. He's a therapist who wrote a book called The Transparent Self. And I met him when I was 18 and he was a nice fellow. And the, that's why I read his book. But he said, you can measure a person's mental health by the degree to which they authentically reveal themselves to another person. So there is something innately healthy about revealing oneself and being honest and being truthful and letting and confessing some things. And that is the power of the healing circle big time. People have confessed all kinds of things in there and people have revealed you know, how scared they are or how uncertain they are or how much they hate themselves. And there's something about saying it out loud that we all carry a little bit of the burden and it lightens it up for everybody. And, you know, even in nature where there's the nettle plant, you know what the nettle plant is? It's yes. one with sharp needles. Yes, there's another plant that grows nearby that if you rub it on the place where the needles, it will take the pain away. Nature is like that. And the healing circle is when you confess, there is enough love to help you heal it. It's just, it's an awesome reality and it's an awesome process we're not supposed to do everything by ourselves even the important things we're we're, supposed, we're part of the community we're part of humanity and we need each other to 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 help and then so much benefit comes when i get to help other people when we help each other so much help comes to the person that's the receiver but so much help comes to the people that are the givers it works that way it's it's a wonderful process and uh, tell me more about the healing circle we stay in a circle uh, a person tell his story and another one at um, uh, when uh, when i finish they give me the feedback tell me more about uh, how i see you how what i give you um the format that i use in the yeah. healing circle, I call group on one, where the whole group will focus on one person at a time. And there's something about being looked at by a lot of people without judgment, with full of acceptance. That in itself is, is just healing. It's helpful. It's like, oh, well, if they think I'm okay, maybe I'm okay. And then it plants the seed of being okay. If I can't find that seed by myself, I can benefit from the other people seeing me in a good light. And then as part of a person's turn, then I will do therapy with them in front of the whole group. And by therapy, I mean, I will help them go a little deeper. And some of the revealing that happens at that level is just so, it's so human. It's so, other people will cry, other people will laugh. It's just so beautiful. And then at a certain point, I will open it up because the feedback from the other members of the group is something that's also very, very helpful. It, it just helps to be seen in a good light. Children that grow up being seen in a good light by their parents grow up to be happy people. Mm. People who grow up as children seen in a bad light by the parents, they think, oh, you're a bad kid, you don't follow directions blah, blah, blah. Those are children that don't feel good. Those are, they turn into adults who don't feel good about themselves. It's a lie. It's a lie that we swallow. It's like eating bad food. It's like eating bad information. 
why it's more powerful because when I tell my story in the healing circle, it's more powerful than when I work with you sometimes. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> no, no, of course, you're right. Sometimes it was more powerful in the healing circle. Well, because there is something about making my story public. Yes. And then if I make my story public and, and I'm not judged, you know, when you come to me, you pretty much know I'm not going to judge you because I'm a therapist. You're hiring me. I'm not going to say, oh, wow, you're really messed up. Although I might say that to you. <laughs> <laughs> not you personally. I would never say that to you. <laughs> um, but when it's public and not judged, that's so powerful. Yes. Um, what about emotional eating? Well, emotional eating is based on several lies. Lies? Lies. How do you say lies in lie in Romanian? In chewing. <laughs> Me okay. and chewing. Just to be clear, everybody gets what we're talking about. The several lies that emotional eating is based on go like this. One of them is food is love. It's a lie. Food can be grown with love, prepared with love, served with love, received with love, eaten with love. But food is not love. So when we try to fill ourselves with food because we want love, of course, that's called emotional eating. We, we do that to fill something that it can never fill. That's the lie. And the other part, the other lie is when we try to hide our feelings with food, now we're not just trying to fill ourselves with love that food can't do, but we're, we're trying to stuff our feelings. And that's a lie because it doesn't work. No. It, it works for a short time. That's the trouble. Because feeling good can override feeling bad for a little while. It doesn't make the pain really go away though. That's the only problem with emotional eating. It doesn't work. And it is generally driven. Emotional eating is driven by the child part of us. So that means even when we know better, we can still find ourselves doing behaviors like emotional eating. Even when we know better, the adult part of us knows, you know what, this isn't gonna work and it's, it's not love. So the point is, not just to know that intellectually, but to reach the child part with the real love. And the good news is we can do that for ourselves. Sometimes it takes the love of other people at first, but we can reach ourselves with that love. It's just the same way that you would be kind to a child. If, if, if you have a child and it, she falls down and hurts her knee and starts crying, you're not gonna give her food. Are you? <laughs> or will you pull out your checkbook and write her a check? <laughs> oh, here, here's five dollars, you know. No, the child wants love. No. And then this strange and wonderful thing is you can kiss the, the knee, the boo-boo, yeah. and the pain goes away. That's that's what I do with my clients. <laughs> <laughs> no, scratch that from the interview, please. <laughs> Well, Andy, <clears throat> I want to ask you if why if if we need to confront our parents for what they did. I know that they 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 know more to do that, but we need to talk with to sit down and talk with him. I'm in favor of that. Why? To to show up, this isn't about changing the parents or yes. making them feel bad. That's not the point. The point is to show up as a real champion for the kid part of us. Finally, somebody is speaking the truth. When the things that I couldn't say as a kid to my parents, I can now say as an adult. And I want the kid part to listen while I'm talking to them. And I'm, I'm not gonna be mean, but I'm gonna say what I mean. 
And there's a big difference. Mm, beautiful. I didn't make that one up. That's an old AA saying. Say what you mean without being mean. And a lot of times, you know, my daughter confronted me. And at first I was shocked. It's like, wait a minute, I'm a good parent. Why are you saying these things to me? And I had started crying. One tear went down my cheek. And then after a minute, I was just proud of her. It's like she feels safe enough to say something to me. And then I, you know, I said, I'll, I'll help you as much as I can, but I think you should go see a therapist. <laughs> and she did. I said, I'll go with you. I'll, I'll answer any questions. And at first, when she confronted me about some things that I did when she was a kid, at first I started justifying and explaining it. But then I realized that doesn't reach the person. I needed to apologize. I needed to recognize how this affected her as a kid. And so I just said, I'm so sorry. I can see how that really hurt you. And then maybe later I will give reasons, but the reasons don't, the reasons are not an apology. Reasons pollute an apology sometimes. Yes. Uh, what does it mean for you the word disease? Well, disease is a good example of something out of balance. Because we're part of nature. We're, we're part of nature as much as we think we're not. That's another lie, by the way. But we are a part of nature. And when we're not respecting the laws of nature, something will show up. Some disease will show up. And so that's what's brilliant about the approach here at Hippocrates. The point is to just restore the powers of nature. Here's a quote for you. Nature alone cures. Our job is to expose our patients to its restorative forces. You know who said that? Who? Florence Nightingale, the mother of modern nursing. And if I have a disease, tell me three things that can help me to heal myself. Only three. <laughs> <laughs> Only three? <laughs> well, okay. I mean, the main question to ask is what can I do to return myself to nature. You know, the body heals. It's what it does, right? I pinched my, I don't even remember what finger it is. I was unfolding a tripod or something and I pinched myself and it started bleeding. Now I don't even remember. It doesn't hurt anymore. I can see a little bit, but that's, the body does that naturally. So did I have to do anything to make the healing take place? No, not really. But it just goes faster when I eat clean, when I, uh, when my energy is not so busy in my head and hurting and being hurt, when my energy is clean, when I'm back with nature, that's when the body does what it does naturally. That's when healing takes place. So the question to ask is, what can I do to get back to nature? I need to change, you know, my diet, my lifestyle. What's the state of my relationships? How can I make peace with, with every part of my life? How relationship affects us? Um, well, relationship is so basic and fundamental to who we are. We're, we're born into relationships. And because we can't survive by ourselves when we're babies, relationship becomes a means of survival. And we will do whatever it takes to be loved by the people who are taking care of us. If they want us to be quiet, we will be quiet. If mm. they want us to speak French, we will learn French. If they want us to, you know, think a certain way we will change we will change ourselves to adapt to our relationships that's how powerful relationships are in our life and we transfer that childhood survival re relationship with relationship into our adult relationships 
That's what we call codependent. We look to one other person for our own okayness. And then we become over-dependent on the opinion and the judgment of other people and the approval of other people. But even when we're clear, we're still connected with each other. We're still subject to relationship. Relationships are a great arena for growing and learning. You have two books. I have only the, the first book, oh, yeah. Deep this... Healing. Deep Healing. I want to know what this title means. Well, deep it's... Feeling Deep. Deep Feeling Deep Healing. Well, I just noticed over my years as a therapist that when people had deep feeling integrative experiences, their physical health skyrocketed quickly. Somebody who was in major physical pain from cancer, when they did deep emotional work, there was somebody sitting in this office. She was, after her session, she was going like this with her hand on her liver. And I said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm looking for the pain and I can't find it. Mm. And so I said, congratulations, you're our new poster child for the mind-body connection. I... So that's what deep feeling, deep healing refers to. That when, when you get to the deep feeling level, which every human being has, because we're deep beings, and we put certain feelings into the hidden depths underwater, we have to dive and find them again. And when they come, they bring a lot of healing with them. And that's what this book is all about. I talk about the science of psychoneuroimmunology. And I think I got it down to 13 principles. And some of them explain the mind-body connection and how we can actually use these principles to navigate our healing process more consciously. Tell me the, the most beautiful, uh, I will show you the other book. Tell me the most beautiful uh, story that you see here with the people that you work. Yeah, uh, the most beautiful story? Yes, the most beautiful transformation that you see. Okay, and I have to pick out of many because there's so many, uh, which are also available in my new book. Because my, both of my books have a lot of stories because they're so compelling. You know, I don't, want, I don't just want theory. I want to know something that works. And there was a woman that I worked with who was very obese. She was very overweight. She worked as a nurse in the hospital. She worked for more than 60 hours a week. And then when she went home, she took care of her invalid brother. And of course, you know, she didn't eat well. She never took care of herself. And the more I worked with her, I asked her, well, why don't you just cut back your hours? Why don't you just change what you eat? Why don't you let your brother go live with somebody else in the family for a while? Why don't you take care of yourself? And she said, I don't know why I don't take care of myself. And when I worked with her over some time, she told me the story of how she grew up and her mother was mentally ill. And her mother um, would very often threaten to leave her. If you're a bad girl, I will leave you. And one time in the middle of winter up north, she took the, her, the little girl, my client, and put her outside in the snow she didn't have her shoes on. And she said, that's it, you're out of here. And so my client relived the moments when she was banging on the door, begging, oh. mommy, please let me in, please, I'll be good, I'll be good. Then when this little girl, when my client was five years old, her mother committed suicide. Mm. How do you think a five-year-old interpreted that? It was my fault. And it was my fault because I'm not good. I'm bad and that's why my mother left. She threatened to leave if I'm bad, then she left. And so there was this five-year-old level of anxiety. I have to be good. And so that's why she worked as a nurse for 60 hours a week. 
It's why she never paid attention to herself because she thought that was selfish. That's why she took care of her brother. And the food. And, and the food was the only thing that she had. Once, when she finally got to the point, the deep feeling integrated point, where she felt how the, the responsibility for her, her mother's death wasn't hers. I could have told her that. I knew that. Even the adult part of her knew that. But finally, that realization reached the child. But until then, as the little girl, she was, this woman was on the floor. She was sweating. She was shaking. She was coughing. Until it finally, the realization hit her. The horrible realization that my mother left me because I'm bad was suddenly in the light. And she saw it as a lie. And within a very short period of time, this woman lost so much weight, it was incredible. She sent her brother to go be with some other brother and sister, and she cut her work back to half, to half time. The things I could have told her to do that in the beginning, but none of it, it didn't click until it clicked. Oh. So that was very profound. Real physical changes, her body type, changed dramatically and in her own way she had tried all kinds of diets did she stick to any of them no because the anxiety that she had been carrying was so strong it ruled her life and this time she made it conscious and she did not die and then the body relaxed i know that you have hundreds of many stories, stories. Thank you. Um, My books are full of those stories. They're they still how I get still make me cry. How I get real. How I get real. Um, and th by the way, this has a this has a line in front of it because this is still the proof copy. This isn't the get real book. Real, doesn't get well. the copy get real? Get well. The power of authenticity to heal. How can I be authentic? You start by telling the truth. <laughs> so easy. <laughs> and there are three levels of truth. And I've described these more in my book. The first is just the facts. The curtains are green. That's a fact. That's easy. Nobody, if somebody argues with you, it's no big deal because you know they're green. The second part is, you know, I don't like your green curtains. It's how you feel about the truth. That's a little more risky. Because if I don't like your curtains, you might not invite me to your house anymore, right? And the third level of truth is confession. That's what happens in the healing circle. That's what happens in the 12-step program. That's what happens when you're intimate with somebody. You, conf you confess, you say more deeper truth. It would be like, I really feel horrible that you have beautiful curtains because I don't have any beautiful curtains in my house. It just makes me feel terrible about my life wow. that's level three <laughs> it's all about the curtain and of yeah. course it has nothing to do with the curtain but i i i can enroll anything to be part of and i'm doing it all the time you're doing it all the time so you start by telling the truth and if you if you don't have people that you can tell level three truth to then Cultivate that. Find people that you can share with. Join a women's group. Go to therapy groups. That's where the agreement is to share at a deeper level. And I find it addicting. I love telling the truth. I love hearing the truth. And the truth that I'm talking about, what I mean by that is my emotional truth, what's true for me right now. When, I, when we first started this interview, I was a little nervous. I'm not that nervous right now. If my nervousness had stopped me from being part of it, I would have confessed to all of you. You know, I'm feeling really nervous. I don't, and then confessing, it would have freed my energy in its own way, right? So that's vulnerable. I'm this famous therapist or somebody, I'm an author, and I'm nervous about an interview. That's vulnerable. 
but I don't I don't mind being vulnerable anymore. It's just it's part of what helps me get where I want to go. Yeah. I want to ask you something. Um I saw the um the story of a woman. He was lonely and he has a very little baby, one month baby. And he worked in the night and left the baby lonely in, in the house for a lot of time, one year, two years. I want to know what that baby uh, think about life, about him, about what, how will be in the future that baby? The younger a person is when these traumatic things happen, the deeper and longer the effect tends to be. A baby would conclude, might conclude several things. One, my needs don't matter. Even bigger than that, a baby might actually conclude I don't really exist. Oh. And they will bring that into their adult world. And those are devastating beliefs to have. My needs don't matter. You know who that affects the most? People who carry beliefs like that end up getting cancer more than other illnesses and more than other people. Why? Because I think it's such a life-denying belief that it, it sets the stage. It drives cells crazy. It's not natural. It's not, it's not part of the divine blueprint for who we are. We're meant to be. We're made to be joyful creatures. And when to have a belief like that, you forgot to turn your notifications off. <laughs> yes. All right. And how will be that child in the future, like, like an adult? Anywhere from mildly neurotic to seriously psychotic. Oh. Seriously psychotic. These can be the people that do the school shootings. These can be the people where my life isn't real and I need some kind of huge event to show me that life is real. That's why teenagers cut themselves sometimes because there's nobody listening to their pain and cutting themselves makes them, it acknowledges, yes, I am in pain and I'm in control or whatever they're working out. The stuff that we don't deal with ends up running our lives unconsciously. And if we're the kind of person, if we're not happy, if you're not happy, it means you're carrying some kind of a burden. The good news is whatever you're carrying, you can, you can get some skills to learn how to pull it, put it down and let go of it. And then pick up other things that are just, that serve you better. That's seriously good news. That's what therapy is all about. It's not just about coping. Real therapy is about transforming from going beyond suffering into actual thriving. How food affects us? Food? Yes, what I eat. I mean, it goes back to the, you know, we're part of nature. And when we, the more we process foods, we're removing it from its nature. And then if we eat processed foods, we will then be doing the same to our body. And then the farther away we are from nature and what we eat, we will get sick. That's how it affects us. And some people, I mean, the whole thing about whether to eat animals or animal products, that's like an issue because I grew up eating meat. I didn't question it. My favorite food was Wiener Schnitzel. <laughs> I grew up in Austria. Yeah. I loved Wiener Schnitzel. I never knew it was a little lamb or a veal or whatever. A little, it's not lamb, it's a little cow. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, then we moved to the States and I, my favorite food was hamburgers. And I thought, even as a kid, if I can have Wiener Schnitzel and hamburgers every day, I'll be happy. Until, I mean, for me personally, I 
I had a girlfriend who was a vegetarian and it's a long story, but I actually, by being with her and eating what she ate, a stomach ache that I thought was normal went away. I thought that's just what happens when you eat. I, I thought everybody had a stomach ache after they ate. And then it was like, oh, wait a minute. I don't have to have a stomach ache. And then I just started learning more and more. And I've been a vegan for a long time. And I don't have a stomach ache when I eat. That's not natural. So food really affects us. And the more towards nature, which in my opinion is raw, living food, vegan, the more you go to that, the more you can see what nature really is. And nature is full of energy and nature is high. Nature is, you know, it's like a sunflower, you know, it's like, ah, it's, so, it's out there, it's beautiful, it's radiant. And that eating clean really helps me find that energy because it belongs to me. You know, and they say, you are what you eat. So I want to eat nature. Do you think I can be fully conscious if I eat animals or only if, uh, if I eat scoop food, animals, then fast food, I can be fully conscious? Well, I mean, it's, uh, it would be audacious for me to say, no, you can't. I mean, Jesus supposedly fed people bread and fish. And nobody said, is this gluten-free bread? <laughs> <laughs> is this non-GMO fish or whatever? So I think he fed them what they were used to eating. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he made any comments about, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven unless you're a raw living food vegan. So I'm not going to say that either. I just think it helps. It just helps. And personally, if Jesus came and had dinner at my house, I think he would approve. <laughs> Tell me more about uh, one or two questions I have more. About the living food. I know that you have a session. Yeah. <laughs> living food. What is living food? Well, living food means... The difference of, oh. uh, with living food and raw food, because there are two things different. Um, okay, I'm raw thinking about it now. Living food. Well, I give me an example of something that's raw that's not living. Yes, so a vegetable and a living food is a sprout. Oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> I was just going to say all that. <laughs> but I believe that when I have a piece of broccoli in my hand, I think it's still growing, right? If I cut a flower and I put it in a vase, the flower doesn't know that it's dying yet. It's still, while it's still fresh, it's still potentially, it's still living. But I get the distinction you're making is that when something is sprouting, it's a young baby plant. And he grow when I, when I eat it in the same time. When I eat it, he grow. It's, it's still, it's growing. It's growing <laughs> and it grows within you. Yes. So don't eat watermelon sprouts because the the watermelon will grow inside of you, <laughs> and that's how you become pregnant. My last, uh, I want to tell you that you are my favorite <laughs> psychotherapist. You and Anthony both. I think we'll... I've never said my watermelon theory out loud before. <laughs> <clears throat> the last question. Oh, it's if a doctor tell me that told me I will ha I have only three or six months to live, and I believe what I can do to change this belief. I think that's a big part of the Hippocrates program is the education part, where for some people it takes them a while to take off the pack of what they learned the pack of lies that they heard from the medical world. It's not like the medical world is evil necessarily, but they, they just don't know. And because we grow up respecting doctors, you know, sometimes I will, I have actually worn a white lab coat here. You've never seen me do that. Mm -hmm. 
And I tell you, people really listen better when you wear a white lab coat. <laughs> Except I can't get away with it here. It's like, Andy, it's not Halloween. Why are you wearing a lab coat? But we're trained. And it is true. There are many stories of people that were told you have six weeks to live and they, they die on time because they believe it so much. It's the power of belief. And so we're in the business of helping you shift and change your beliefs. It's like, no, they don't, they just don't know. And the more people that I've seen who were given a time limited amount to live, who defied that, that just has strengthened my belief that doctors don't have the final say about how long you live. Those are based on statistics about people that don't do this program. So people who do this program are outside the curve of statistics. Over and over again, I see that. And that's just hopeful. Thank you very much. Andy. You're welcome, my pleasure. You are my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, don't tell Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye. Bye.